Sachs. My name is David Malin, and let me give you a sense of the arch for a typical class here for the course of the semester. So typically it's in lecture where we'll obviously present new material, concepts, and I'll also introduce typically the projects every three or so weeks when they're newly distributed. And then before or after, depending on some scheduling logistics, we'll also offer every two out of three lectures a, a section of sorts in person led by me, which typically amounts to a code walkthrough of the current project, uh, helpful hints and pointers as to where you should focus your attention so that you can budget your time as well for the next week or so. And then virtually, will Mahesh be offering both virtual office hours and an online section, one of which he, he's done already. A few of you tuned into that. So we'll be sure to send announcements to the courses listserv when he does similar virtual office hours. What I think we will do regarding sections is we clearly have this option to do it either before or after. I'm going to try to get a sense of exactly what's optimal. Um, staying late is not appealing to me, certainly not you as well, but I think having them contiguous, either section then lecture or lecture then section does tend to be convenient. So let me follow up by email as to what we'll do starting next week. Tonight, just because people's expectations were set, um, we will do a bit of section code walkthrough right after, but I suspect with tonight's lecture we'll actually finish that material a little early, so we'll end up rolling section into lecture itself and we'll see if we can't get e all of us and uh, this pizza out of here right on time. All right, so with that said, um, any questions that you'd like on camera this time? No? All right, so you may have noticed that not only were the lectures of last week's uh, the videos of last week's lecture online, as well as the audio recordings, but as of today, also the podcast version. So the official version comes in the form of real video, which those of you tuning in from home are presumably using to watch this very lecture. Those videos, the real video versions, are synchronized with HTML-based slideshows of sorts, because I essentially uh, record the times at which each of these slides go up. However, if you'd like a more portable format, be it MP3 or QuickTime movies, know that you can via the course website's podcast link. Go ahead and download this material to your local computer and view it or listen to it offline without an internet connection, or I dare say hang on to it after courses end if you actually want to uh, keep hearing me haunt you after the semester ends. Uh, and so follow the course's uh, links appropriately and just let us know if you have questions. Tonight's about diving in deep to XML and one of the first of two programmatic APIs to it. That is, how do you write code that uses XML? That's one of the questions we will answer tonight. But uh, look back first, as we'll try to do, to it so as to tie the lectures together effectively. Uh, last week, we looked at some of the basics. Besides the course, we looked at some basics in the world of XML. J2EE, for those unfamiliar, as of last week, this week, give me a sentence on what J2EE is. Okay, computing in a container, and I couldn't parse this. Okay, so Java 2 Enterprise Editions, so that's true, and let me, let me come at it from a different angle. It's Java classes and libraries that are enterprise specific, plus all of the standard stuff. So we recall are going to be asking that you download the so-called standard edition and then just adding to it various enterprise components. But again, this won't happen until about mid-semester when we turn our focus to all things server side. All right, XML in a sentence, what is it? Uh, extensible uh, markup. Extensible markup language? What does that mean? It's an uh, extension of HTML. Oh, an extension of HTML. So that I've got to push back on. Oh, okay. um, they're very much related. HTML is sort of like the poor man's version of XML. It's a bit sloppy and such. XHTML is, in the other direction, a derivative of XML. Um, but I wouldn't so much point uh, the finger in the other direction. But it's certainly tag-based, and it has similarities. And most of us were probably familiarized with HTML or XHTML before XML, even though it's perhaps the second XML that's the simpler of the two, since it's the more general of them. But what is it? What's it good for? Meta language to define other languages. OK. So it's a meta language with which to define other languages. And for those of you who aren't so familiar, <laughs> one of us should turn off his phone. Uh, so those of you who aren't so familiar with those kinds of terms, um, know that that will make sense in at least two or three weeks' time when we look at XSLT, which is, I see several of you turning off your cell phones now too, <laughs> so it's not just me. Um, when we look at XSLT, you'll see the first such incarnation of a language that's written in XML, <laughs> a language that's written in XML and thus sort of embodies this idea that XML is a language with which you can pen 
other languages. All right, so the what, that pretty much covers the what. The who is the W3C who standardizes these things. That sort of information is useful so that you know where to turn to for authoritative information. When, so the past several years, how, why, and then we looked at the course. So let's dive in a bit deeper here. So tonight is about looking at XML itself and introducing the basic building blocks that comprise an XML, that compose an XML document, uh, C data sections, elements, attributes, these kinds of things. And then looking again at this thing called SACS, the simple API for XML uh, 2.02. Then we'll glance at, we'll also look at what's called JAXP. So this is the Java API um, for XML processing. And what this essentially means is this is the term applied to all of the XML related Java support that comes with Sun's JDK these days. Essentially, they rolled into the more recent versions of the official JDK, the support for XML, and most, if not all, of the classes that collectively support XML within the JDK are called JAXP these days. We'll also look tonight at something called Xerces. This is a piece of freely available software, um, a de facto industry standard software that you can download from Apache and that we'll be using throughout the semester that is quite simply an XML parser. This is a program whose sole purpose in life is to read in an XML document and do something with it. And we're going to fill in the blanks as to what that something might be tonight and in future classes. We'll look generally and briefly at the overall idea of parsing, what it means to parse a document, and specifically an XML document, because that, in fact, is what you'll be focusing your attention on in Project 1. And we'll end with a look at Project 1, dubbed my first XML parser. As I promised last week, we have given you the framework and much of the implementation for one of these XML parsers, but it's missing some features, some important features, and it's in your implementation of those that we hope you'll get your hands dirty with the inner workings of a parser and really understand from the bottom up what the implications are of actually using XML in various applications in the first place. So let's consider this for the next few moments as a representative document. Representative in the fact that it's, yes, fairly arbitrary since we just banged it up as such, but we try to um, uh, incorporate into this document all, all or at least most of the various features, if you will, of XML. So we're going to tease apart all of the various tidbits in here so that we lay the groundwork for some terminology and concepts that we'll use throughout the term. So this very first line, and just to relate the two, after, before, Notice that the first line of the file is that open bracket question mark XML dot dot dot. That's what's generally known as the XML declaration. You can kind of infer what this thing does. Among other things, it clearly indicates what to the program reading this document. So it's clearly an XML document, right? Open bracket question mark XML. What else? Yeah, version, so that's a hint to the parser, the program reading this document as to what version of XML it is in case that's important. And then it also uh, mentions, in this case, the encoding. So what kind of encoding scheme, whether it's UTF-8 or 16 or um, US ASCII, some ISO format. If you're not too familiar with various encoding um, schemes for text-based documents, short of it is it probably doesn't really matter. Yeah. Good question. So though we ha have laced throughout the course some of the, the definitions of XML 1.1, for all intents and purposes, they are equivalent. And the changes that were introduced in XML 1.1 are essentially immaterial. Um, but when we look at the recommendation online, we'll tend to look at the latest recommendation. However, most many programs out there today were only hard-coded to understand 1.0, and so it's safest just to write 1.0 in your file so that things don't break for no good reason. Uh, so just to point out some of this uh, useful things to know about this, it's optional, doesn't have to be there, but if it is, it's got to be at the top. Moreover, it's got to be the top left character in the document. That is the very first byte of the document must be part of this XML declaration if it's going to be there at all. Silly point, but worth mentioning because if you ever get some kind of parsing error, it literally can boil down to you having a space or a carriage return or a new line character at the very top of your file. Unfortunate, but such is the way, uh, such is how things are. Um, and then the two other bullet points summarize what you already put forth. So this next line, doc type, and if you on your printouts for tonight want to flip back two pages, you'll see this thing in context. It was the second line in the file, and the document type allows you to reference what's called a, 
a DTD. So I think we said last week that there's this way of ensuring that an XML document looks like what you hope it will. That is, there's a way to define the format of an XML document. What kinds of tags must be in it? What kind of attributes those tags must have? And you can do that by way of what's called a DTD. So the means by which you associate an XML document with its definition, its DTD, is by way of one of these elements. Open bracket, bang, doc type, and then the name of the root element, which is a term we'll look at in just a moment. System just means look on the local file system for the specification. Quote unquote students.dtd is the definition is the file on the local file system in this case that describes what this kind of XML document must look like in order to be quote unquote valid. But this is a topic we'll come back to in lecture eight, as well as nine and ten when we look at XML schema, which is sort of a, a better version of this same idea. Um, worthy of note, perhaps, is that, and this will make more sense in lecture eight or become more obvious. Um, DTD, oddly enough, is perhaps the only language besides Java we'll look at in this course that itself is not XML proper. It was sort of this interesting design choice where it's almost laughable how almost everything we'll look at is written in XML, despite its verboseness. You'll see very unwieldy forms of XML accomplishing what's otherwise a simple task just because it's so verbose. And recall, terseness in XML documents is of minimal importance. That will prove to be quite the case as we go on. But DTD, oddly enough, we'll see in a few weeks' time, doesn't look like XML at all, which is actually kind of a pain when it comes to implementing an XML parser, because you have to implement a parser for this language as well. So more on that to come. Now we get to the basics, the fundamentals that are useful, if not fairly straightforward in the first place. So an XML document at the end of the day is made up of one or more elements. The first of those elements is the so-called root element. So the thing that appears at the top of the document and beneath which everything else seems to be nested or indented, if you will, if you have a lot of white space in the document, is the so-called root element. You can only have one of those. It's got a start tag, it's got an end tag, and everything in between it is, uh, is um, comprised by that element. So what do we mean by only one? Well, again, you'll see this will become old hat very quickly. But if you have an XML document that's a foo element, and then you have some stuff in your document, we'll see what kinds of stuff can go there before long. Close the tag as you would in HTML. What you can't have in an XML document is yet another element at the same level, so to speak, as that first one. It's invalid. So everything's got to be nested inside of one outermost element, the so-called root element. Uh, as you might guess, um, as you might guess, that when you open a tag, you've got to close it symmetrically. Any of you familiar with HTML, which we'll assume in this course you are, same kinds of rules, same kinds of intuition as HTML. And worthy of note here, and this will become important when you're actually implementing part of your own parser, is that there are restrictions on what the names can be. Um, most helpful to remember is that names of elements have to start, or tags really, have to start with a letter or an underscore and not numbers. So even though you might be inclined in many contexts to start to name things with numbers, can't do it. So unfortunate limitation. And again, that's what I'll try to draw out in this discussion, because uh, ultimately these are very sort of simple, if not uninteresting details. So what I'll try to highlight is the things one might otherwise trip over over time, rather than emphasizing what a start tag and an end tag is, which is perhaps belaboring the point. So there are different so-called content models for elements. And this too, though a definition for tonight's purposes, will become a fundamental concept throughout the course when we start doing more interesting things with XSLT and XPath and other languages. Inside of an element, you can have one of four different types of stuff. Either another element, aka element content, in the first example there. You can have what's called PC data, which I mentioned last week in answer, in answer to a question about C data. PC data is just text that gets parsed. It's not skipped over and returned as one block. It's actually looked at character by character in case there's like special characters in there that need to be escaped or um, treated specially in some other way. So the second example here is a name element, and inside of it is Jim Bob, which is just a text, a text node in this case. Or you can have mixed content. And this is sort of a weird example. We'll see much more reasonable ones before long. But you can have other elements and or text intermingled. And as soon as you got both, it's called mixed content. Finally, you can have no content. You can have empty elements, such as this one here, which in this context seems meaningless. 
but can you recall any XML element that you've seen before that's atomic, so to speak, that's empty in this sense, but yet still has some useful meaning, even though it has no children, it has no attributes? Yeah, so like line break in HTML, or more properly XHTML, in and of itself doesn't have any attributes, it's got no hierarchy to it, but it does have meaning. And so empty elements are certainly useful, and often they're useful even in XML proper documents, such as here, where maybe there is no dorm associated with a student, but we need to have that element there for thoroughness's sake, for instance, so that it's clear that it's not an omission, but it's intentional, that there's no data within. All right, what about these things called attributes? Well, in the world of HTML and XHTML, attributes sort of control the behavior of tags, of, um, of elements. Well, in XML, attributes can mean anything, because ultimately you're the designer of these documents. So they typically describe further, or certainly relate to, the element that they're attached to. So there's some, there's some rules associated with the names, essentially start with letters or underscores, and so, or some other stuff thereafter. Um, but the values is where it's perhaps important to note. They've got to be quoted, so none of this lazy HTML approach of sometimes quoting things, sometimes not quoting things. XML and in turn XHTML are incredibly rigid when it comes to these kinds of rules. You've got to quote it. Doesn't matter if you use single or double quotes, but you've got to use them. Moreover, you can nest, as you might expect, as in other languages, so long as you only do it, say, once in this context here. But there are two gotcha characters. You may not have in an attribute either of those two characters, or at least the latter you can, can't have alone like that. You can only have it as part of what's called an entity, which we'll get back to, like NBSP, if you recall from XHTML. Okay, so let me just pause for a moment, because some of these are basics, but I nonetheless don't want to rush through anything too quickly. Any questions thus far, or trivia that comes to mind? Hmm. Sure. No, I do remember the question. Let me just see if it comes up in another context right away. It's a good question. Sure. Um, let me address it now. So the question at hand, as it was last week, was when to use attributes and when to use, as we'll call them, children elements or child elements, net elements and element content model that's nested inside of another. Well, let me actually toss it around and see if we can't use this to sort of echo what we discussed last week. So at, you've got a piece of data that you want to associate with some other piece of data in your document. Do you make it an attribute or an element? What kinds of thoughts should at best go through your mind? So if it's extensible, if, if the piece of data you want to add to the document itself might in the future have some kind of hierarchy to it, or if you can sort of re further refine that piece of data, then you might want to make it an element so that you have that capability. For instance, if we've got in some XML file an element called student, and this thing's already got an ID like one, two, three in this document, and now we have the close tag down here. Well, suppose that there's some stuff in there, maybe the dorm as we've seen earlier. Well, suppose all of a sudden you realize, you know what, we really need to remember the name of students. It's not sufficient to store just their ID numbers. You can extend the definition of this document to include, for instance, a name field. Well, one way you could do this, actually, is just say, all right, well, let's just add another attribute. Name equals Joe. And actually, Joe, OK, Jim Bob has become Joe Bob now. So we could do this. All right, what's the downside now of taking this approach? as opposed to making it an element. Yeah, exactly. This is sort of a collective piece of data now. And even though you could break on the white space, semantically you haven't distinguished first name from last name, and you can't. There's no means of expressing that within the attribute other than by inferring that white space separates the two. And perhaps that's sufficient, but that's not really the point of using XML typically in the first place. Better might be to at least put it as an element, like name, then put Joe Bob in here, which is now essentially equivalent to the previous approach. But if in the future we decide, or the boss decides, that we really need to be able to distinguish first from last name, you can then in the future change this 
such that inside there no longer goes just the PC data, but yet another element, and a second element, first and last, and you can tag the individual pieces of data within there. So that's sort of the kinds of thoughts that should go through one's mind. You'll appreciate more after diving into project one, though, that there are also some coding implications for whether something is an attribute or an element. I, per, I when writing XML-related software, often just throw a lot of things in attributes because it turns out that with various APIs, SACs among them, as we'll see tonight, it's just easier to get at attributes than it is to get at child elements. I can write less code if I just want to get at attributes than if I go with child elements. But there too, it depends on the language you're using. So as is often going to be the case, short answer is depends. But the, the important thing here perhaps is these kinds of thoughts and questions, not so much the answers. Uh, okay, so PC data. Um, we said what it was. It, these things called entities are again those things that you've probably seen like ampersand NBSP semicolon. Those are sort of special escape sequences that have predetermined meaning. You've got them in XML, um, but uh, P and PC data can contain them, is all we're saying. But it cannot contain, again, open bracket or ampersand by itself. By itself meaning not part of an entity. All right, entities, let's elaborate. So well, they're used as sort of escape sequences to represent special types of characters or uh, content that you might use frequently. There are only five in XML. Ampersand, uh, less than, uh, greater than, apostrophe, and quote, the double quote mark. Only those five. So despite the example I've been using verbally the past couple minutes, what's glaringly missing now? What entity is not apparently built into XML? Okay, so the NBSP, which is perhaps the only entity that many of you have ever even used in your own web pages, just because it does have some utility. So this will be an interesting thing, actually, when we get to this language called XSLT. As you'll see, XSLT is going to be very commonly used for generating web pages, for generating XHTML. Well, XHTML often contains NBSPs, but if you're generating that XHTML using XSLT, but XSLT is just XML, and XML doesn't know about ampersand NBSP, what you're going to run into in just a couple weeks are parsing errors. Because if you try to put NBS, ampersand NBSP semicolon, the parser, the XML parser, is not going to know what you're talking about. And I point this out now because, one, there's, uh, there's definitely a solution. You can define at the top of your documents NBSP to be the Unicode character that's appropriate, as I've done here. So tuck that away and mentally. You can copy and paste that in the future. The gotcha, though, is that whereas proper XML parsers like Xerxes, which will predominantly use, obey these rules and throw an error if it encounters something like NBSP and you haven't defined it, just realize and you'll appreciate firsthand that there's a lot of software, commercial software out there that just like browsers are very tolerant of sloppy web programming, they are tolerant of also sloppy XML coding. We'll use Stylus and an XML spy in this course, or at least if you have Windows machines, you'll be welcome to use those with Harvard site licenses. They, they add NBSP to this list of predefined entities, just because it's useful. And it seems un silly to have to force the programmer to put in such a basic definition atop, say, all their files. The catch, though, is when you start to write portable code and code you want to run elsewhere, not appreciating these sort of um, th these nitty-gritty details, if you will, means your code is going to break often if you make certain assumptions. And so what we will try to emphasize in this particular course are some of the basic definitions so that you're not caught confused by your own code when it breaks when you move it from, say, system to system. So C data. We have PC data. Here's the more formal definition of character data. Long story short, it's like text that's not parsed. So it, the parser, when reading the document and it encounters the so-called C data section, it's going to just eat it all up without looking at it and then hand you, the, the software that's using the XML parser, all of it without resolving any entities, without checking if it has an open bracket inside, without checking if it has ampersands all over the place. It just ignores it all, eats it all up, and passes it along to you. Those of you who do a lot of web programming might actually see that top construct throughout your own documents. It's very common these days if you're trying to write XHTML compliant web pages, if you've got JavaScript inside of your web pages, 
Well, the proper way to include JavaScript in XHTML compliant web pages is to throw it all in a so-called C data section, which tells the browser or whatever validator you're running on your own code, don't parse this content. Just eat it all up and don't analyze it for validity. The reason being, JavaScript is obviously not XHTML. It's obviously not XML. It's not valid. So you don't want the parser to think that it should be valid. Back in the day, if you were worried about lack of JavaScript support, you would just encase it in a comment tag, um, something like this, an HTML comment. Well, that's fine, but stuff within HTML comments or XML comments are treated as PC data, essentially. They are parsed. So we'll, you'll come to use this often. And we in the course's website actually use C data a lot because it's particularly useful in including HTML, if not sloppy HTML markup, inside of an XML document. And most of the course's website actually, even though it just looks like a bunch of web pages, is actually dynamically generated based on configuration files that are written in XML. So that Mahesh and I, when we want to update the course's website, we change a couple lines in an XML file, hit save, done. The website updates itself. It's all dynamically generated. And anytime we want to include HTML in that config file, we typically wrap it in C data sections because you have to. But there very quickly comes a line where you're starting, we ourselves are starting to get lazy and sort of violating the separation of content versus style. But then again, the other metric to use is how much time does it take to update the website? It's a lot easier sometimes to copy and paste stuff just in slot, um, slide it inside of one of these things. So comments. Uh, it's hard to spend much time on comments. That's a comment. You know I'm in HTML. You can use them in XML as well. They're not comments for the program receiving your document so much as they are for the human who might be looking at the document. Processing instructions, by contrast, are like comments or really configuration parameters for whatever program is reading your XML document. So if you want your XML input to somehow influence the behavior of the program that's parsing it, that's reading it in, you can use what are known as processing instructions. These aren't terribly often often used, I would say. We'll see at least one example of it in a couple of weeks' times, but you should know that they exist. And in effect, they're like ways of tweaking the behavior of the program that, again, is reading in your document, as opposed to the human whose eyes might just be looking at your document. So that's it. That is the XML 1.0 and 1.0 recommendations in a nutshell. Questions on what XML is? Because we just got the XML portion out of the way, of the course out of the way, and now we get to dive into the interesting stuff. How to actually use this to achieve tasks. All right. So we know what XML now is, presumably. So you can describe it verbally with all, these, all this nomenclature. Who cares? What can we actually do with an XML document? Well, suppose I have some document, students.xml, on my hard drive or on some web server, and I want to read it in. I want to get the data out of that document in some useful form. Well, the typical use case with XML documents is that they're just files on disk. You write some software that opens that file, reads in the data, and does something with it. Well, how do you get the data from the file with all these tags and all of this useful but um, logically useless data, all the metadata, and actually do something with it? Well, you can use in the world of Java and other languages what's known as the simple API for XML. This is essentially a quick and dirty API for getting at XML comment, the content. It is, in effect, a streaming API in that it reads a file from top to bottom, left to right, and every time the software, the SACS API, encounters something interesting, like an element, an attribute, a comment, a PI, uh, PC data, it essentially triggers an event, or rather it invokes an event handler. You are that event handler, or rather the person who implements the event handler, so that when this interesting data is encountered, you can actually do something useful with it. So using the SACS API essentially means implementing these event handlers. And we'll see now exactly what those are. Suppose that this is our representative document. This time it's much smaller so that the example actually uh, fits within the space we have here. Well, what does it mean to parse this document and handle the events that are generated? Well, at the top here, this is the 
think one of the only times I'll ever use PowerPoint animations, since I think it's far too overused. But here, I think it's actually illustrative. So up top, we're going to see the XML document sort of character by character, as though maybe we're downloading it off of the web and parsing it uh, character by character. Or maybe it's just on our disk, and we're just reading it in from a file handle. On the bottom, we're going to see what's going to henceforth be known as a content handler, which in Java speak is going to be the interface that you must implement if you want to handle the XML-related events that occur when reading in this document. So let's see this by example. So the very first event handler, aka method, that's going to get called in your software when you tell an XML parser to go read an XML document using SACS is a method called start document. Which is to say, if your software that you're writing that wants to use XML in the first place implements this method called start document, which does have a more specific method signature, that method will be invoked and you can do whatever you want the moment the XML document starts getting parsed. You know, in simple terms, you might just print out to system.out start of document. Here we go. All right, what happens next? Well, now we begin reading the file. All right, so we've just read in open bracket s-t-u-d-e-n-t-s. We're almost at the point where we've encountered something interesting because the next character was what from our representative document? So it was a space or? All right, so, so it was a closed bracket. So we're not actually going to see any attributes. So what's going to happen? Well, I've essentially split the animation here because at this point we already know, or rather the XML parser already knows that the element's name is students. So the event that's about to get triggered is called the start element event. The first parameter to this event is the name of the element. Take a guess what the second argument is going to be to this event handler. Helps if you have your cheat sheets right there, which shows you too. What else might be interesting at this point in the document? Attributes. Attributes. So the start element event handler is going to be given two arguments, the name of the element and a list, a set, or a linked list, whatever. It doesn't matter at this point in the discussion of all of the attribute value pairs. In this case, there are none. And so using this pseudocode syntax down here, what's effectively invoked is just the nil list. So start element is called with students as its first argument and just null as its second argument. And this stuff down here, again, is pseudocode. To be clear, we'll actually see in a bit what the actual Java code looks like, but it's almost equivalent. All right, what happens next in the document? Well. The next character to actually be read is that open bracket. Without looking down at your papers, <sighs> lots of heads just came up. What is the next event handler, do you think, going to be? Even if you don't know its name, conceptually, what might it be? OK, so another start element, because the next thing in the representative document was what? Was what? Oh, it was an element, but what element was it? So it was the student, singular one, perfect. Yeah, we're all wrong. So what's going on here? You're s right, so you're seeing the limits of PowerPoint animation here. It's not, the next character is not open bracket. It was actually new line, space, 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 then open bracket. Whereas I think I promised last week, white space handling is not necessarily obvious in XML, but the default behavior is just to preserve it all. So for tonight's purposes, we're preserving it all. So it turns out there's another SACS event in the specification called the characters event, which is essentially PC data. I'm not sure why they called it characters instead of PC data. That might have been a little more consistent. But it's called characters. And its argument is the string of text that appears before the next element, or rather, before the next event might get triggered. And even that's actually a little bit of a white lie. In this example, just as a technical aside, I have invoked the characters event just once for the new line and those spaces. There's no requirement in the spec that contiguous characters need to be wrapped up into one event invocation. If the parser wanted to be lame and invoke characters, looks like five times, one for the new line and one for the four spaces, it could. And it would be up to your software to concatenate all of those characters together that were passed to you by way of different events. So just FYI. All right?
What happens next? Well, the parser proceeds to read in student, so we know it's going to be start element. Are there any attributes this time? Turns out there are. So the parser goes and reads this attribute value pair. And it's actually that kind of code that you yourselves will be writing for part of project one, implementing support for attributes. We know at this point that there's at least one attribute value using the sort of pseudocode here. I'm just going to write it using like set notation as a tuple. Now notice that the content model for that student element is what we would call what again? Uh, not child element, for the student element. The, sorry? There were four content models. Which one's applicable? No content, the empty content model. Again, uh, meaningless nomenclature, but at least conceptually helps you distinguish some of the possibilities, which is relevant when you're writing code along these lines, or for at the parser level, as you'll be doing. But there's no chil children to this element. We're going to simply then call the uh, start element method as such. And now, ah, I spoiled it by hitting the spacebar one too many times. What's the next SAX event going to be? There's a corresponding end element. So again, anytime something interesting is encountered in the document, and interesting is my own sort of spin on what's going on here, an event is triggered for starting elements, ending elements, characters, starting a document. Take a guess. What's going to be the next, again, without looking down, the next element, or rather, the next event to be triggered at this point in the document? Good. So characters, because we do, in fact, have a new line no spaces this time. And then do we finally see the end element for students? And then finally take a guess for the last element, uh, the last event and document. So that's it. So just to give the summary then, if you were writing a program software that needs to process an XML document and you chose, based on your familiarity with all the options, the SACS API to do so, you would implement in Java in this course. All of these methods, which are part of a Java interface called the content handler interface, you would call the parse method using the JDK. Your document would be read in. Every, anytime something of interest is encountered, your implementation of these methods would be invoked. And what you do with that data is completely up to you. All we're using is the parser to hand us the data. What you do with it is totally up to you. Yeah? Two yes? Excellent question. Is the XML validated before SAC starts off? I get away with this answer. It depends. So, I, well, it depends on the parser and on the developer using the parser. By default, with Xerxes, which is what you'll be using, which comes with, J with the JDK these days, by default, validation is off. So nothing gets validated. So malformed is different, actually, and we'll come to this in just a moment. There's a difference between well-formedness, so to speak, and what's called validity. And I've only been using the term thus far, validity, um, last week and tonight, but there is a difference. The document must be well-formed to be read at all, otherwise the thing will just quit because it can't make safe assumptions as to what the data is. So before, before, start, how would it start before exactly. So it make sure it's uh, correct, correct. So actually, this is a good, uh, good point to point out this distinction. So thus far, we've used this term several times, valid. So a document is valid. OK, so a document is valid. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. A document is valid if it's consistent with a DTD, that definition. So we're not sort of taking the, we're not showing you what's behind the curtain, what a DTD looks like just yet, but assume for now that there's a way of describing in an arcane syntax what an XML document must look like. What do I mean by that? You can say that this XML document must have a student's element. It must have then zero or more student elements. Every student must have an uh, ID attribute, and every student element must have a name child. That's what I mean by defining what the document must look like. A document is valid if it respects that definition, that spec. It's invalid if it's inconsistent. So if you fed that same specification, a sample document that has all that, but students for some reason have no ID attribute, invalid, because the spec requires that they have an ID attribute. So in, week, in lecture eight, will teach you how to write these specifications. But for now, know that there's a way of defining them.
So that's what it means to be valid. It's consistent with some spec. And let me actually just show the, the other relevant term now. A document, by contrast, is well formed if essentially it follows all of the rules and all those bullet points that we began tonight with. So what does that mean in summary? It means that all attributes are quoted. If you don't quote an attribute's value, the document is not well formed. It means that, and I'm going to use some casual terms here, tags are symmetric. So if you open foo and then open bar, you've got to close bar and then close foo. So again, things you take for granted in the world of HTML. Um, those are the two biggies. There's more, clearly, because there's more to the specification, but it's the spirit of these kinds of syntactical details that define well-formedness. So back to your question about SACs. If the document is not well-formed, none of your SACs events are going to get handled because the document just can't be read, can't be read safely at least. If, though, your document's well-formed, it looks pretty aesthetically, but it's missing things like ID numbers, it's missing names for students, and thus it's invalid, SACS is going to keep firing all the events unless you tell it when instantiating the SACS parser, that is the XML parser, validate this document for me. And if you tell it to validate the document, but the document comes in as not valid, then you're going to, there's also other methods besides the ones I've listed here implicitly, like fatal error is another method that might get invoked. Yeah? I'm getting a little confused by this. If SACS is a pretty parser, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if, it's, if it's pretty, if you, if you have, say, 100 students and, and student number 80 something gives the wrong proposal you have, right? it's going to fire all those attacks up until it, it hits that bad student, and then, and then it will throw those checks and say, oh, you're missing. Okay. So you're correct. So I misspoke earlier when I said that the whole process is short circuited. It's short circuited at the point the error is encountered. So in that, and there are different types of errors that are spelled out carefully in the spec, the worst of which is fatal error. There's also a warning, and then there's one other I called, I think, parser error or something that's sort of middle ground. And it's ultimately actually, and even that was a bit of a white lie to say that it's short-circuited. It's actually up to you, the person using the SACS API, as to whether or not you want to let the parser proceed to try to throw additional events. The idea, though, is that if a fatal error is thrown, you had best respect that because who knows what kinds of subsequent events you're going to get. So ultimately, it's left to the developer, but the process in theory should be short-circuited when you do encounter, for instance, um, uh, imbalanced quotation marks or some kind of asymmetry in the tags. So as soon as that's encountered, for precisely that reason, especially if you're uh, using it as a streaming parser and you don't even know what the rest of the data looks like, you can still use it, but there could be an error in there somewhere. And but SACS can handle that. So, hmm? mm -hmm. for that you have to check uh, statements that are using the image code. So you can't check the validity of a document if it's streaming into you byte by byte. You're going to have to wait till the whole thing's received, since validation is sort of a an aggregate operation. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get. Mm -hmm. Well, so by default, no. I mean, it's not actually that common for folks to write software that's as sophisticated, so sophisticated that it actually starts processing the document as it comes in off the wire. I mean, if you imagine almost any networking-based software you might have written, odds are, even if you grab some piece of data remotely, you don't start doing anything with it until the socket connection is, say, closed, and you actually have the bytes from the remote server. So you can use SACs in this streaming sense. But I would say that almost always will a typical developer just be using it to open local files or local um, XML structures in memory. So this very fancy sort of sophisticated approach of using it as a streaming parser in the literal sense, super streaming data off the network, I would say is fairly uncommon. Possible, but not the common case. Uh, yes, absolutely. So if you turn on validation, one of the downsides is, of course, the performance hit that you might take. For small documents, it's probably irrelevant. For large documents, probably is more relevant 
the questions we'll begin to ask actually when we look more specifically at DTD and XML schema is why you should bother validating XML. Often XML is used only internally. And if you trust your code to generate XML properly, well you certainly shouldn't need to be validating your own data. By contrast, if you're taking data off the wire from say Amazon, it might be a reasonable um, risk to incur to just assume that Amazon's code is only going to be returning valid XML data to you, so you're not going to bother validating it constantly. But even that's going to be a design decision more than anything. It's up to you whether validation is on or off, but by default it's off. At least with Xerxes, which is what we'll be focusing on. Okay, other questions? All right, so let's actually use this. What we'll try to emphasize also in lectures is not just presentation of material, but actual real code and getting our hands dirty with actual use of these things so that you've seen it all before, before you dive into various projects. So in Hmong tonight's printouts is another handout, which is source code. And what I'll try to do often is when we're going to have sort of prepared demonstrations in classes, provide the source code so that you're not scram uh, frantically scribbling anything down and so that you also have it for reference afterward. This first file, saxdemo.java, is, as the comments suggest, a demonstration of sax 2.0.2. That's just the latest version of the API and it's been around for several years at this point. So, how do you write a Java-based program that reads an XML file and somehow gets at the data? Well, obviously I'm choosing in this case to use the SAX API to get at this data. And I'm going to go ahead and not do terribly much that's interesting with it. I'm sorry that it's a little cut off. They seem to have taken our remote control. Um, I'm not going to do anything terribly interesting with it, but we'll see where and how I could actually use the data that's returned. So notice first here that my little class called SAX Demo extends default handler. So what is this? So recall that the interface that you need to implement, at least parts of, in order to use SAX using Java, which means in turn using JAXP, which means using in turn the JDK, and these terms will become clear, the dis differences uh, in due time, means implementing those kinds of methods that we saw in use. Characters, start elements, end elements, start document, end document. Those are all defined in the content handler interface. Let's make this more real. One of the most frequent links that you'll likely be visiting this semester is one of those atop the course web page's resources page. And the very first category is APIs, which are pretty much the most commonly used links here, I would say, because they're terribly useful. And even I, whenever writing this stuff, you just, there's just no reason to memorize a lot of the stuff when it's so easily accessible. I'm going to open up the second link, Java API for XML processing, JAXP, specification 1.3. All it is is Java doc. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, much of which, some of which is self-explanatory, most of which you never need to get to because the juiciest stuff really is exposed by way of the examples we're looking at now. If I scroll down to Content Handler, click that, notice that it is again an interface. It happens to be in this package, which perhaps makes sense as well. Scrolling down, notice that these are not the pseudocode versions, but rather the actual Java signatures for these various methods. So if I'm writing code that needs to read an XML document, I can implement this content handler interface, implement these methods, and then do something to actually jumpstart the parsing process. And we'll see that something in a moment. But notice that at the top of this Java doc, there's this mention of all known implementations. Default handler is one of them. So there are what, maybe 10 or so of these methods here? kind of a pain if you're trying to write software and write software quickly to have to implement all of these uh, event handlers if you don't care about all of them. For instance, if you don't care about processing instructions, why should you have to go and copy and paste the signature for this method and implement it somehow if you just don't need to use that kind of data? So what the JDK provides is a uh, null implementation of all of these methods. That is Sun copied, pasted all of these signatures. They then opened a squiggly brace, closed squiggly brace. That's implementing the method with just no statements inside of it. The upside of that is that when you actually want to write SACS-oriented code, you can simply extend the default handler. And using this basic idea of inheritance and overriding of methods, can you now override those default implementations which do nothing so if you want them to do something, 
you just override those null implementations. Well, how do we do this? Well, first of all, let's put that on hold for a moment, the idea of extension, and look at what this program does, because I've wrapped the main routine into the actual class itself. First, when we run this thing, it's going to do some sanity checks. If the number of arguments isn't equal to one, print some usage. So it looks like what this thing is going to do is expect that you provide a file name of an XML file. And what this program is designed to do, this demonstration, is just to show you in pseudocode the various SACS events that are encountered when we read in a document. So let's take an example here. So I'm going to go and borrow from project one samples directory XML subdirectory. You have all these files with project one, even if you haven't dived into them yet. Let's look at um, maybe five. That's a little ugly. Let's look at four. OK, so let's look at four. It's pretty simple. So sort of commit to memory what that looks like. It is well formed, even though it happens to all be on one line. That's fine. You don't need some pretty white space. So that's 4.xml. I'm just going to copy that over to the examples directory that I'm working in right now. And go back to my examples directory. Now I have my sax demo and 4.xml. I'm going to compile the sax demo in the traditional way. And I'm going to run sax demo on 4.xml. Enter. What this program, again, is designed to do that I wrote is just to print out the pseudocode for the sax events that get triggered when reading that XML document. And the pseudocode I refer to is exactly the same pseudocode that we saw when we did that little PowerPoint animation. So how is this working? Well, let's go back to the code here, saxdemo.java. So notice that the first thing we do is just check usage. Pretty uninteresting. Then we grab the name of the file from the argument vector. Then we try to do the following. Much of what you'll see throughout the JAXP API is all um, exception oriented. So you usually try to do things and you catch the predefined uh, possible exceptions. So what are we going to try to do? The two lines with which in Java today you can implement a, an XML parser or rather a SACS parser to be more specific is those two lines. Create a new factory and out of that factory churn out a SACS parser. This is the so-called factory approach to instantiating objects. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, don't worry so much about it for now. Second line, instantiate our little demo. So I'm just instantiating a copy of myself, right, just for demonstration purposes. Finally, and this is the beautiful method, you, once you have your SACS parser, which we got from our first two lines, all you have to do to parse an XML document using Java is call parse on that parser. What do you need to pass it? You need to pass it the file, or the file name in this case. And what else do you clearly need to pass it? You need to pass it a handler. Because this is a SAX parser, you need to provide the parser with some way of contacting you in the reverse direction. You need to be able to tell the parser what methods to invoke in response to those interesting events. So we're going to pass him an instance of handler, which is this class that I'm implementing. Well, why is this relevant? Well, let's first take a look at the parse method there. So if I go back to the Java doc and look up this thing. Sax parser. Well, what we'll see down here is that there's a bunch of different parse methods, kind of overwhelming at first, but they're just for flexibility. But one of them there hopefully is a file name. That's a file input source. Looks like here are our string ones. Let's see if there's actually one that's meant to be local. Uh, default handler. Was it further up? Those are files, though. I think the bottom two are different. Yeah, it's the bottom two. So it's described more generally in terms of a URI, but it's one of these bottom two. Um, the reason being, yes, it's a file, but notice that the only thing we're passing it is a string, the file name input. So which one is called is not terribly important. What I wanted to point out, though, that the second argument here, though, is in this case an instance of default handler. At least that's how it's spec'd out, which just means that if we're passing it handler, clearly what is this thing an instance of? A default handler. Well, that's the case because of inheritance. We're extending default handler in the first place. Well, what does that mean? Well, we could look at we could look at default handler and see what its methods are. 
but you should know it already because we said earlier that default handler just implements all of content handler. So what was content handler? It was the interface that defined things like start element and fast forwarding characters and fast forwarding end element, start document, end document. Well, let's start with the easy ones. I copy pasted the signature for this method from the Java doc. Not much you have to be careful about since you're actually overriding a method. So it's important to make sure you maintain the right, um, the right definition. What is my program, SAX Demo, designed to do upon the start of a document? Just print start document. You could change that to be anything. I just wanted to print out my sort of pseudocode. End document, by contrast, prints this. What about characters? Well, characters, <coughs> characters is up here. And it's a little ugly because what you're actually passed isn't a string, but an array of characters, for tonight's purposes, just because and you're given the index in that array to the start character, the first character that's relevant, and the length. And this is actually done for efficiency reasons, so that you can actually keep the whole thing in the character array and just pass in um, substrings within it, essentially. What am I printing? Well, this looks ugly just because of all the parentheses and quote marks, but I'm just printing out that same pseudocode syntax. So the interesting method, the only interesting method, if I may, is start element. And it's scary looking only because of the complexity of my pseudocode with all of the quote marks and squiggly braces and so forth. But what's relevant for now is the signature. So start element takes a URI, a local name, Q name, and attributes. For the most part, these things tend to be the same thing, Q name and local name. We'll come back to this issue when we talk about namespaces in the future. But for now, uh, Q name is the only one that we're going to focus on. That's the name of the element encountered. Uh, so recall earlier in my pseudocode, I sort of simplified things. When I said start element just takes two parameters, the name and the attribute list, technically takes four, but the other two are not all that um, uh, revealing. So Q name is the name. Attributes is a reference to some kind of object call, or some kind of class called attributes. It's essentially a linked list for our purposes. And this pseudocode here is just doing the complex printing of all the attribute value pairs in that pseudocode syntax. So at the end of the day, even though some of this code is misleadingly complex just because of the aesthetics, this is all it takes to write a Java-based program that reads in an XML document and reads out the interesting pieces of data within it, all driven by this SAX API. Let's go ahead and take a five-minute break. that we can hopefully get a few folks on the same page, especially those tuning in from home. If you've already, if you've never used the FAS computer systems or have never even SSH'd before, let me at least on film show you how I got to the point that I've been at for the past hour. And then let me invite those of you who just don't know how to SSH or if this five second tutorial is far too little, just drop us a note and we can pass along a handout to you as well as pull you into the virtual classroom and actually walk you through it technologically um, in the same window as you. So what I did on my PC here was I previously downloaded a program called Secure CRT. I double clicked its icon and I essentially get a, an empty screen like this by default on my system. Secure CRT is what's called an SSH client. SSH is Secure Shell. This is a protocol for controlling an account from one computer that's remotely on another. What does this mean? Well, you're going to be using in this course the FAS uh, computer system or computer cluster called nice.fas.harvard.edu, new instructional computing environment. It's a Linux system that we have configured by way of a configuration program for all of you in a standard way, such that you have the latest version of all of the freely available tools we'll be assuming and teaching throughout the semester. Those of you who have already run CSCIE 259 setup essentially configured your accounts for with the course's configuration parameters. How do you get to the point I was at? I launched the secure CRT right uh, a moment ago. I'm going to go to File Connect. By default, when you download this software for free from Harvard via the course's website, you'll see a list like this, a bunch of machines on campus. The one that you want is nice.fas.harvard.edu. I have this one called Lecture, which just means the font is bigger, so we can capture it better on screen and in the back rows. I'm going to double click that. It's going to ask me for my FAS username. It's going to ask me for my password. And then I get a blinking prompt. 
Those of you who have not used Linux before will take some getting used to, and I would urge you to contact Mahesh right away if you need some, um, some hand-holding, some hints on actually how to make, get around this environment. Um, but for now, know that this is sort of like a DOS-like, command-line-based environment. Everything you do for the course doesn't need to be implemented on this system, but it needs to work on this system and be submitted on this system. The first of those requirements isn't as arduous as you might think. The idea of almost all of the code and APIs we're using is that they are by nature cross-platform. So in theory, your code should be portable from your own Windows or Mac or own Linux distribution to NICE if you just upload it via SFTP, for instance, and it should just work. But as we all know, oftentimes should doesn't mean does. And so you don't want to leave this process of uploading your code for submission till the last minute, lest you lose points on projects just because you didn't have enough time to tweak, for instance, a backslash n versus backslash r issue, for instance, from um, Windows to, say, a Unix system. With that said, at the blinking prompt, I'm within my so-called home directory, my personal storage space. Before class, I happened to create a CSCI 259 directory. In there, I copied tonight's examples and also Project One's code, which we'll uh, focus on at the end of tonight's class. And then I went into my examples2 directory using the cd change directory command, and here's where we were before. A whirlwind tour, to be sure, but just email Mahesh and myself if you'd like a bit more instruction on this. All right. One last demo related to the first is called Sax Demo 2. The only difference between the first version and this version is that I added a couple lines of code here to make explicitly clear what white space is actually inside of this document. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go ahead and compile Sax Demo 2, which you also have a copy of. I'm going to run it on that same file, uh, 4.html, and seems to be the same here. All right, so what's going on? Let's go ahead and open 4.xml. And I'm going to actually just change it. I'm going to move this in. I'm going to say, uh, let's see, quux will be my element. So now we've got some indentation. Uh, we've got another child element. I'm going to save it. I'm going to run Java of Sax Demo 2 on 4.xml now. And now notice that, oh, interesting. Funny that that doesn't work. OK, little bug, which I'll fix after. So what you should see now is this clear use of, um, <laughs> let's just fix it now. So what you should see is that the new line characters in this document are explicitly being printed. Um, let's turn this into an instructive exercise. And which method must be the code whose job it is to print this kind of white space explicitly? OK, good. So in characters, scrolling down here, so this is why this is a pain with the expressions here. You need excessive numbers. Let's see if this is what I want. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Oh, that's why. Uh, I was futzing earlier. OK. Java C, Sax Demo 2.java. OK. So the way the story was uh, supposed to play out a moment ago is as follows. So now we see explicitly the characters events showing backslash n as opposed to actually printing in rather ugly form, which they did the first time around, would have the first time around like this when they're outputted literally. So again, this is just to help meant to give you one another example of the use of the Sax parser, but also if you like to wrap your mind around exactly what's going on, looking at the second version perhaps makes more clear what data is actually being encountered in the document. So on this slide here, we just have a summary of some of the packages and the classes we looked at, but as the ellipsis suggests, there's clearly other things related but we have all semester to uh, peel back the layers. So what are we doing here? Well, just a couple of sort of programming languages um, uh, comments on what's going on in the first place, what it means to parse. So parsing in general, as you may or may not know from other contexts, programming languages being um, a canonical one, Parsing means to take a document and to sort of break it down into some of its basic components. In the context of XML, those basic components are things like elements and PC data sections and PIs and comments. But they could be other things. If you're writing a parser for a language like C, um, tokens might include keywords like for and while and things like open squiggly brace and closed squiggly brace, those kinds of um, entities that have some sort of lexical or logical meaning. In XML, though, it just means reading in the document and doing something, reading in the document 
and determining which of those, which among all of the characters are interesting things. And by interesting, again, I mean elements, like PC data, and those kinds of things. So how does a program know how to parse a document? Well, hopefully, it is parsing the document based on some set of rules, typically based on what's called a grammar. Uh, Bacchus Nauer form, or BNF, is a common way of describing, in a very formal way, a theoretical way, if you will, what a document or a bunch of text needs to look like. And it's perhaps best explained by way of example. If we wanted to formally describe what it means to be an arithmetic expression, you know, we could teach a class, say, of grade school students by example. Well, this is an expression. Uh, this is a bigger expression. And you could sort of build up by simple examples. And a reasonably intelligent human being can sort of infer from sufficiently many examples what you mean by arithmetic expressions. Fortunately, you can't just sit there talking to a computer and have it eventually sort of just know what you're talking about, sort of, uh, endeavors in artificial intelligence aside. So you, the human, or you, the developer, can specify in a formal way what the document or what the data that you're going to give this program to parse should look like. And here is perhaps one definition for what we know as an arithmetic expression, uh, arithmetic equation. So we have what are called terminals and non-terminals in a grammar like this. And those of you who have taken classes like theory of computation here or elsewhere might be familiar with these kinds of terms from um, parsing uh, applications. So that first line there, EQM, stands for equation. It's a non-terminal in the sense that there's no quotations around it. The colon colon equal sign means that an equation is defined as follows. Term followed by a literal, a terminal, equal sign followed by another term. What's a term? Well, a term, in turn, is a parenthesis followed by a term, operator, term, close parenthesis, or another a value. What's an operator? A operator is either of the following literals, plus, minus, division, uh, multiplication, and a value is any number. But there I actually got lazy, and just putting in angled brackets, any number isn't quite formal, but it's certainly sufficient to get the idea across at this point. So this is a formal way of defining an equation. And we can come up now with a whole bunch of examples of arithmetic equations that hopefully are in accordance with that formal definition. Well, why is this useful? Well, if you have a very precise definition for your language or your data, it's actually relatively easy to write a parser for that language. Because all you have to do, especially if you've defined your data in terms of a grammar, namely in bacchus Nauer form, BNF, you can actually just implement one method, usually, for each of the rules in your grammar. And each of those lines there, each of those rows, is a rule. Which is to say, once you have the hard part of defining the language, writing the parser is relatively easy, because your blueprint is the grammar itself. And this will be useful in the context of project one, because what we're going to give you is a grammar for XML, albeit a simplified version of XML, so we can throw away some of the distractions, that looks like this. And your job is going to be to complete the implementation of an XML parser. And the only way that you know how to do that correctly is if you're doing it in accordance with a spec. And the spec comes in the form of a grammar in BNF. So this is going to be essentially the simplified grammar that Project 1 spells out and explains in more detail than we'll do with a hand wave here tonight. But you can already kind of get a sense of what it's, how it works. An element, it consists of a start tag followed by content followed by an end tag. Well, what's a start tag? It's a literal angled bracket followed by a name followed by a closed bracket. What's content? Content is either an element or character data zero or more times again and again and again and again. So AKA mixed content. So again, it's not the exact XML specification. It's a simplified one. But it's a precise one that we can actually go about implementing in project one. I'm sorry? Car data. So uh, car data, char data here is zero or more characters, except excluding the angle bracket. Yep. Other questions? And we'll come back to this probably in just a moment in the context of the uh, PDF for Project 1. All right, so Project 1. So Project 1 rather collapses some basic um, 
some basic aspects of parsing. So those of you who with strong backgrounds in programming languages know that parsing actually consists of multiple phases, tokenizing, recognizing. We're blurring the distinction in parsing, as is often the case when you write what are effectively quick and dirty parsers, because the takeaway for us is not so much what it means to be a parser and what it means to be a grammar, but rather to give you this, um, this uh, gr uh, ground floor up understanding and appreciation of what XML parsing and what the XML itself is all about. So in what we'll call my first parser, we just describe all of these processes collectively as parsing in the manner in which we've been speaking all night. What you will be implementing though is part of what's called a recursive descent parser. What this means is a parser that essentially operates recursively based on rules. What rules? The BNF rules that we showed you a moment ago. Um, I'm going to wave my hand at all of this now just because I think this slide might be useful to look back on once you've looked through, if you haven't already, Project 1 spec. But what you're doing is certainly clear by way of the examples and the sample code that we'll look at right now. So what I'm going to go ahead and do, why don't I go ahead and just roll in to the end of lecture here what we would normally do within sections so that one, we'll have it on camera, and two, we'll also have you all out of here earlier rather than later, which seems to be the consensus. So I'm going to go ahead to the course's website, and I'm going to pull up the PDF, and this will be representative of the process that seems to be appreciated by students um, at the start of a project. Its distribution is really giving you a quick but a helpful, hopefully, walk through not so much of every one of the problems, but what I'll try to do is prioritize the problems for you, tell you which problems, and you can circle them. You should be able to bite off after a particular lecture and which ones assume knowledge that is still to come in, say, some future lecture, since it's, uh, these things are usually uh, laced across multiple weeks. And typically, we assume that after each lecture, you'll be able to comfortably do at least one third of them not 100% of them. All right, so um, getting started portion. And some of this, I'm going to go quickly just because some of these details are better read at home than read aloud. But please just stop me or look confused if I'm going too quickly. So first couple steps are going to have you get an FAS account so that you can do what I've been doing tonight and configure your account so that it's in accordance with our configuration. Um, the fourth problem, the third and fourth problem, the third problem asks you to subscribe to the course's listserv. If you or if any of you tuning in from home have not done so already, do so immediately following the listserv link on the course's website and not only subscribe, look through the archives, which you'll be referred to by way of a link once you do subscribe so that you know what announcements have gone out in the past. You can subscribe in digest mode if you'd rather get one email at the end of the day as opposed to multiple emails. Right now it's a quiet time of year, but what you should find is that the listserv is useful not at just for Mahesh and myself to say push announcements to you, but for you all to engage in discussions with each other about configuration problems you're having on your local machines, getting Eclipse to work, these kinds of things, and then perhaps some conceptual questions you might have as well. But do bear in mind um, in the spirit of academic honesty and such that it's not appropriate to forward your source code to the list and say, can someone help me debug this? All right, so what the spec does in hopefully more than sufficient, in hopefully sufficient detail is really walk you through the code so that these specs are designed to live independently of even these walkthroughs so that you really have a resource at hand when you're at home reading through them. So this first long problem essentially walks you through the process of just playing around with the code you're given, copying it over to your account in the first place, and just generally acclimating you to the environment you'll spend the two or three weeks on. Often the problem sets will have a couple of quickie questions. They are meant to be done usually in the order in which they're presented, um, though there are some exceptions to that depending on what material we do which night. They're presented not just to quiz you on mundane material, but to plant honestly hints or ideas in your head before you tackle the actual implementation details. They're usually placed in the projects to give you, to, to again seed your mind with ideas that are presumably relevant for the rest of the problem. So here you have a bunch of those. Mm -hmm. um, incidentally, no, and I'll do a wave of the hand here, number six and seven and eight and nine mention not only SACS, but also DOM. As you can tell from the syllabus, SACS is tonight, DOM is next week. Needless to say then, if tackling this stuff over the course of the next <laughs> week, which you should be to keep, on, to keep pace with the course, skip 
anything related to DOM unless you want to go look it up yourself or you already know it yourself. So it, generally speaking, assuming you've watch the lectures or been to lecture, you don't recognize some term and you didn't doze off at that point, probably means it's coming up next week. So check the syllabus. Number 10 uh, should be doable at this point. So essentially everything's doable up until this point except those questions that are specific to DOM. And in this number 11, do you begin to dive in in this project to that promised grammar? The first thing you're tasked with in problem 11 here is to add support to the parser whose source code we'll pull up in just a moment, support for attributes. Right now, the parser we give you in the form of the Project 1 distribution code is a working XML parser, mostly working. It doesn't know about attributes, and if it encounters attributes in the document, it's going to choke on them, essentially, because it just doesn't expect them. So among your jobs in this assignment is to add support for attributes. Add support for zero or more attributes. So just intuitively, the kinds of thoughts that should come immediately to mind are you're going to need to iterate over the characters in the XML document. You're going to need to look for things like equal signs and quotation marks, making sure they're balanced and such. So it very much at that point is a net lesson in parsing and in correctness. We give you, though, the grammar so that you don't have to worry about supporting absolutely everything we've talked about tonight, PIs, comments, and whatnot, just that stuff which will be quite clear, I think, if you sit down quietly with the spec itself. Um, moving on to number 12, asks you a little debriefing question. Number 13, grows the grammar a little bit, adds a little bit of complexity to it, but nothing that's not um, quite manageable, and asks you to eliminate one other shortcoming in our parser. Um, Oh, you know, I lied. I got those backwards. So the previous number, number 11, doesn't have you add support for attributes just yet. It rather has you make the parser more tolerant to white space appearing at the start of the document. 13 does all the stuff I just said before about attributes. So it's in 13 that you'll implement support for attributes. 14 is a bit of debriefing. 15 asks you to implement a DOM. So 15 you can completely postpone until after next Monday. This is where things start to get cool, especially if you like data structures and sort of more advanced, if you will, programming. Among the things you'll do in this project as well is given a sequence of SACS events, start element, end element, start document characters, build an in-memory tree representation, aka DOM, document object model, in memory, such that you're literally going to build a a uh, k-airy tree in memory based on the XML documents. So that comes in problem 15. It's there where those of you who are coming in with an insufficient Java background will begin to push the limits of your comfort zone, honestly. If you have the question, I think the, the rule of thumb I offered last week, if I said go implement a hash table and you were to give me a blank stare in response, probably means you'll find yourself uncomfortable perhaps at this point, but that's fine. It's not insurmountable, but just realize that this project is representative of the kinds of Java backgrounds we'll be assuming. This should be a doable problem set for anyone in this course. 16 is debriefing. 17 asks you to eliminate one other shortcoming, which is to add support for so-called empty elements, those without any children, those atomic elements, so to speak. And we spell out the grammar in slightly more detail. So again, the project is really meant to escalate as you advance throughout it, making it increasingly interesting, but also simultaneously a bit more uh, engaging and challenging. 18 is a debriefing question. 19 is uh, essentially a, a warning. 20 is about Java doc. 21 is just meant to be tongue in cheek. And then finally, we take the training wheels off in 22. So I would say as you budget your time over the next couple of weeks, ideal is a student who tackles everything from problems 1 through 21 between now and next Monday, but skips anything related to DOM. And if you do that, you'll be in very good shape come next Monday to bite off the DOM part, because I think building the DOM, you'll probably find a little trickier um, than just the extensions to the parser, but also what you can dive into after next week, or, or even this week, is number 22, where within the same project, we take the so-called training wheels off. After you've played with my first parser and implemented your first parser, you will put it aside, henceforth, for the remainder of the term. The, uh, the goal is to be, um, the goal is to allow you an opportunity to get your hands dirty, but not to build a product that you're going to be relying on. Rather, 
right toward the end of this project, we'll take those training wheels off, hand to you Xerces, the industry standard parser, or a industry standard, and have you actually use Xerces and with it the official XML APIs to actually implement a program. That program, quite simply, is going to be to write a Java-based program that takes an XML document and converts all elements with attributes to elements with child elements. So in the same spirit of the of converting what were once attributes into elements. And we'll see the same piece of software, incidentally, weeks from now when we look at XSLT. And we will look at much more easy, much quicker ways of solving the same problem with a more expressive language, namely XSLT. So that's question number 22. 23, under brownie points, is meant to be the, for those of you who really like the the nitty-gritty and understanding absolutely everything. And this is sort of a, um, a nice opportunity for indulgence in all the nuances of white space as it relates to XML. So there was a lot of clamoring, I think, in week one, um, as we've seen before, about white space, if only because it's somewhat confusing sometimes. Well, 23 uh, aspires to make more clear all the implications of white space, but in an optional form, since there's more than enough to keep you busy throughout the rest of the project. Uh, scrolling down, this is all about white space, and then about submitting. So the directions for how to submit are integrated into the project itself. And again, let me remind you that many of the students in this course certainly do work on their own systems. And students have done it in Mac OS, Linux, Windows, XP. Um, I'm not sure about Vista yet. We had a question about this to uh, Mahesh and myself. I imagine it should work perfectly fine because the software is, again, largely independent of those kinds of details. But what you have at the end of this and future projects are appendices that we've put together in fairly OS independent form, though I think I typically assume a Windows environment because I have to describe the environment variables using some syntax and I just choose Windows because it's what I tend to use. But certainly you can change, uh, uh, for instance, oh no, I use Linux actually, not Windows here. You can change dollar signs to percent signs based on your own configuration. Uh, contact the listserv or myself or Google if you have questions about those kinds of client-side issues. These are just meant to be checklists, so you can literally go through the appendix, download all of the requisite software, install it, configure your machine, and by the end of the appendix, uh, assuming you have not messed up and I have not messed up, your machine should be consistent with nice.fas's configuration, so you can do all your work on your own machine. And Mahesh has been wonderful about putting together uh, sample Eclipse configurations for students, those of you who like Eclipse or maybe JBuilder, by all means, use those kinds of tools. We provide you with fairly standard distributions in the form of build files, build.xml, ant files that can usually be imported into those tools and much of the setup of Eclipse, JBuilder and the like can be automated based on those files alone. So you're really, we're really trying, you, trying not to tie you to anything course specific, but really make the skills we introduce in this course portable to other contexts as well. So let me spend our final moments here on the code itself. So what project one has you do among its first questions is download the source code for the project. There's a bunch of files we give you, namely all of these, which just flashed before your eyes rather quickly. First glance, it might seem kind of overwhelming, but again, you have a 20 page specification to walk you through it very slowly. So let me give you the high level um, fast introduction to what's in here. If you've never used it before, ANT, A-N-T, is a wonderfully useful build tool that automates the compilation and copying and renaming and chamotting of files. It's uh, sort of a better version of make. Um, it happens to use XML configuration files, though that's largely irrelevant, but it's certainly germane to the course. So the build file, which I urge you to look through, if only so as to learn by example, we're not going to have you writing your own ant files, but they're really not all that hard, and Google can certainly help explain very many things in here if our comments are not sufficient. Essentially, there are a bunch of targets and rules throughout this file that allow me to do the following. In these directories, as you saw a moment ago, are clearly lots of Java files. It's really a pain to have to type Java C, something, something, dot, say, Java, right? That quickly becomes tedious. You have to deal with packages and dependencies, those kinds of nuisances. Rather, type ant. And that build file automates the process of compiling 
all of the source code. And if you don't have much of a Java background, this is a wonderful habit to get into automating these kinds of processes. What you'll see, and the spec makes clear where all this stuff goes, in the build directory is where all of our code ended up. And we try to be good about using packages and industry standard approaches to distributing the code in the course. So you'll see in our build directory and this um, package hierarchy, all of the class files that were generated based on those source files. So let's take a look at some of those source files. In the source tree, SRC, are, is, are these files. So I'm in CSCI 259, Project 1, MF for my first. Here are all the files that collectively implement my first parser, albeit with some of those features missing. Let's focus for a moment on let's say XML parser. So each of these files essentially shadows the industry standard, that is JAXP versions of all of these files. We name them identically, but simplifies them. Much like my pseudocode earlier tonight sort of threw away uninteresting parameters to start elements so we could focus on the juicy stuff, the names of the elements and the attributes there too. So XML parser is going to have plenty of comments throughout to help explain things, and the spec itself walks you through these code, this code, but the parser currently does things like f uh, follows. Here's the parse method that comes with our version of a parser. Notice that the first thing it tries to do is open a file using some fairly standard Java approaches, which I'll wave my hand at for now. Once we've opened the file, notice, and this is the magic, the three things that this parser does is called start document, read element and end document. But whose versions of start document and end document is it apparently calling? Someone, like the handler. So start document and end document are calling a handler's versions of those methods. So here too, even though we're giving you essentially a sandbox environment in which to implement parts of an XML parser, the spirit of it is identical to the actual JAXP implementation. So we'll see in our tester routines how this is actually invoked. Read element, though, isn't part of an API. It's just an aptly named method that we, the course, wrote to implement the parsing process. So notice read element. Read element is implemented, just to give you a sense of how this all works, as follows. Read element first checks is the following a start tag. So somehow the code is reading ahead and checking if the next thing is a start tag. If it's not, well, this is a fatal error, because if we're trying to read an element and there's no start tag, well, then who knows what we're looking at. Well, why does this work in the first place? Well, why did I call read element in the first place right after calling start document, knowing what you know about XML? There has to be a root element. And again, we've simplified things because we're not even tolerating white space in this document. We are making, taking this leap of faith that the very first thing in this document is going to be open bracket something, where that something is the name of the root element. And that's one of the limitations that you will redress per our walkthrough. But for now, it takes this leap of faith, checks, is the first thing it sees a start tag? If so, we proceed to read start tag. So somewhere in this file is a method we wrote called read start tag. Odds are it reads in character by character by character by character until it reaches a space or maybe an angled bracket, stops reading the tag name. Then down here, after reading the start tag, we want to check, well, if we're not immediately at the end tag, what clearly are we encountering? Either, perfect, so mixed content maybe, so either some other element, in which case we want to read element, or characters, in which case we'll call read text. And again, these methods are just local methods we wrote. We name them appropriately to what they do, but they're not sort of part of any sort of API. And the process goes on from there. So it's a recursive descent parser, so to speak, really because of these recursive calls, calling read elements again and again to recursively parse the document using the very same code as we do to parse, say, the root element. And rather than get bogged down in some of the mundane details of lots of source code, let me point to just some of the other interesting things to worthy of note tonight, and then we'll look at the DOM-related code at the end of next week. So this guy should look familiar, certainly by name. What's a content handler? Well, again, in our spirit of simplification,
We did throw away some things that are just a distraction, but here too, content handler is an interface, just like the real version. It's got characters and document, and you can guess what else. Start element, start document, and so forth. What's that? They, characters, absolutely, all the basics we mentioned, but not things like PIs and stuff that it's just a distraction for now, and it would become mundane, I think, to implement absolutely everything. What about default handler? I mentioned earlier that the real API does give you a null implementation of this. Well, notice that our default handler implements, as you'd expect, content handler, but also this thing, which we'll come back to in a moment in response to one of your comments about errors and such before. Notice how I've gone about implementing characters and start document and start element pretty much with as few keystrokes as possible. So those are valid implementations. They just don't do anything useful. But they allow us, again, to override by way of inheritance default handler in our own code. What's an error handler? Well, an error handler is just another interface that provides three, oh, one, real one provides three, ours provides one fatal error, so that you have a means in the parser code that you'll be extending to actually trigger an error. If, for instance, you're reading in some what you think is an attribute, and it's foo equals quote unquote b a r, and then it says baz equals quote unquote quux. Well, at some point, you're probably going to realize uh, there's an error in here somewhere. Fatal error is at your disposal to invoke. So again, simplification of the real world of the real API, but really, I think allows many students to get a a comfort with the APIs because, again, a lot of the distractions and confusing things that we just don't spend time on early on, like namespaces, are put aside for the meantime. Let's take a look at at least one other here. Uh, how about element and then maybe tester? So element is a class that extends something called node, and this is so that, and we'll spend more time on this. You know what? No, nope, I'm going down the wrong path. We're going to get to that next week. Let me not jump ahead. Rather, let's not look at that, but at attributes. So attributes, recall, we've seen where? It's capital attributes. Good, the start element. Yes? No? Yeah, the second argument to start element, or the fourth in the case of the real API. It looks like this for us. I've said earlier that it's like a linked list or something. Well, maybe if you implement it that way. Fortunately, there's just a lot of to-dos in this file. How you implement attributes is up to you. You'll begin to appreciate over the course how they might, should be implemented. Maybe an array is reasonable, a vector, a linked list, a hash map. Um, things worthy of note is that an XML parser, interestingly enough, is, and I think we said this last week, doesn't need to preserve the order of attributes. So if it's foo equals bar, baz equals quux, the parser can rearrange those in memory. And when it informs you of those elements, they can be completely random. So attributes have no inherent order. Elements, though, as we said last week, do. So FYI. This is only to say if you take the approach of using like a hash table, that's fine because it doesn't matter if the stuff comes out in the same order that it went in when it comes to attributes. Tester. Tester, which I think will be our final file to look at verbally here, is essentially a testing harness. And I'll defer its usage to the project spec, but essentially we give you a small framework with which to test your code on some of those sample files that we provide. And there's at least two test cases, one and two, one of which essentially tests your SAX code, uh, or rather one of which tests your parser code, the other of which tests your DOM building code specifically. But again, the spec should leave you quite well prepared in terms of usage and such. Uh, tonight, what I wanted to do was draw your attention to where you should start. And that does beg the question, more specifically, where should you start? Well, when it comes to, there's the white space stuff in the project, but what about the attributes? Because that's the biggie. Based on the walkthrough we just did, where should you probably be focusing your attention when you get to like number 13 or 14, whatever it was, to implement attribute support? What files are perhaps germane? One's an e someone pluck off the easy answer. Or okay, the attributes class, clearly relevant. There were all those to-dos, and it just makes sense because you know it's related to the API. What else has got to change? Yeah, the XML parser.java is going to be a prime candidate for some modifications, right? Because if that's the program, that's the file that's actually doing the parsing, 
yeah, he's ultimately going to use the attributes object, but he's got to populate it and actually grab those attribute value pairs. So really for that problem, you'll be focusing on XML parser and attributes. And why don't I leave you with this so you know where to focus your attention. The following files, if you want to say, uh, do you have a print? Uh, well, you have, if you have your code from last week, I'll just do it verbally. So the files that are relevant to the following week's homework, so to speak, are attributes.java, but not atter.java, which is DOM specific. So those of you seeking to budget time can postpone that a week. So attributes, content handler, default handler, error handler, <coughs> tester, XML parser, and XML serializer. If I went too fast, just glance at the person next to you, perhaps, for what you missed, or ask me after. So those are the files, to be clear, that are certainly worth focusing on over the course of the next week, assuming you do everything except DOM-related parts of the project. And anything I didn't just mention is related only to, to, to the DOM portion. So don't get distracted or lost by looking at the wrong source code files. Any questions? All right, good timing. Let's officially wrap here, and I'll stick around for questions.